It is true I am bald. Don't let this fool you whatsoever. Thank you. I'm honored to be here today. And what I really want to do is to start off with a task. And we're going to split the audience in half. I'm going to want this half to say the word two and this half to say the word four. We're going to do this three times. So we're going to see how good you guys are at learning here. So when I say one, two, three, go, this side will say two and then four. We got it? All right, here we go. One, two, three. Two, four. Two, four. Two, four. Those are the best prepositions in the whole entire world. What? Prepositions? Is this a grammar talk? No, prepositions, meaning at, in, from. But the reason why this is so important is the fact that, thank you very much, is the fact that these two prepositions, this idea of two and four defined me as a man, as a human, as a husband, as a dad. And it starts with this idea of the power of the question. But what's most relevant to me is a story to tell you how I got from two to four. It was 1996. I was visiting my girlfriend at the time in a small city in Oregon. And we were walking. The sky was blue as could be. It was about 28 Celsius. And we entered the dorm room, her roommate, my girlfriend, and myself. And I can remember as vivid as can be as you walk in, the door opens. And on the left, there are two dressers with four drawers, a closet, two desks, really well put together, immaculate, almost like an Ikea catalog, which made me feel like maybe they didn't study whatsoever. Then there was a bunk bed. The, the walls were off white. The floor was white tile with a beautiful rug. And as we walked in, the phone rang. And Alyssa grabbed the phone. She said, uh-huh. And she handed me the phone. Now, no one knew that number. And as I answered the phone, my heart skipped a beat because the voice on the other end said, Jim, your dad is dead. Now, like in every good movie, in a tragic scene, I fell to my knees. Tears came out of my eyes. I was screaming the word no. I had lost complete control. And for the next four years, I spent a lot of time using the preposition to. Why did this happen to me? Why did my dad die at 49? Why did he die when I was 20? Why did that teacher take advantage of me? And it was again and again, the macro conversation I had inside my head was the word two. It happened to me. I was a victim of my own journey. But then something amazing happened four years later. Four years later, now I know we have some car racing fans in here. I was coming home at 2 a.m. I was living in Portland, Oregon. I was driving this amazing 1998 Honda Accord, brand new. I was working for an advertising agency. I opened the 41st office. So I'm 24, I'm shooting way above my skill set at this point, and I'm coming home at 2 a.m. Now, I was thinking in my head, I was Lewis Hamilton. I'm going to give you a daily reference for this time being, because Lewis Hamilton wasn't racing back then. But there was this S turn, and I thought to myself, I bet I can get going really fast with this S turn. And I hit the S turn, and I see this car whip a U-turn. Lights come on, and two thoughts came into my head. Thought one, be the responsible adult and pull over. Thought two, I bet I could beat him to my house. I can get out of my car, and I can get in and get away with the complete crime of the century. I didn't think of option three. When the police officer pulled up behind me at my house, tapped on my window, <laughs> yes, officer, have you been drinking? Yes, officer. Now, I was living with my mom at the time, so needless to say, the fact that she comes out of the house with her baby boy in handcuffs being put in the back of a police car, being taken downtown, was probably not a sight she would want up on the refrigerator. But the reality was that was the best event that ever happened in my life. The judge said that I had to spend two years in outpatient program. Outpatient program, for those who don't know what that is, that essentially is I live my life as normal as can be during the day, but at night, 
I have to go to a therapy clinic for addicts. And I had to go four nights a week for three hours a night for six months. That's 288 hours. Then I had to go one night a week for three hours for six months. And then I had to see a psychologist for another year. And the most profound thing happened to me because I switched the type of question I was going to ask myself. I was going to move from it happened to me to it happened for me. Imagine the conversation, how it shifts. Because at that moment, I started looking for the opportunity of growth, the opportunity to learn. I moved from the position of being a victim to the position of being an opportunist with that change in preposition. And that got me to think, this whole idea of Newton's law, that for basically every action, there is an equal or opposite reaction. So in my mind, every question you ask, there is an opportunity to have an equal and opposite reaction. Positivity, negativity. And so that led me to my book, And what was really important about this is that for 15 years, I didn't know if this whole philosophy in my mind of two and four really worked. But when I started my podcast in 2015, I interviewed over 140 executives from Fortune 100 companies all the way to entrepreneurs and everything in between. And the biggest finding that I had, that I received, that I learned, that I espouse now in this book, is that these leaders who thrived in life who thrived in their job, their home, is that they took their moments of adversity and they said, you know what? It didn't happen to me. It happened for me. That's pretty powerful. And it wasn't just one leader. It was a hundred leaders who went through this. And not all of them had that instantaneous, it happened for me, yay! No, Many of them embraced the suck, right? They embraced it. But it took time for them to get through it, to understand the other side that it happened for a reason. So this really got me to think about this idea of what type of questions do we normally ask as human beings? Most of us don't really put much thought into the questions that we ask. Most of us really just think, how's your day? How was your food? How was your this? How's your that? What was that like? but they're very transactional in nature. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a little experiment in the audience now. And what's going to happen is I'm going to put a question up on the screen. And you are going to take a minute, and you're going to turn the person to your left and to your right, and you're going to ask them this question. And I want you to see how the answer comes out. I want to see how your question comes out. And I want to get a sense of how you feel when you ask this type of question. Are we ready? What? Are we ready? Yes. All right. Here we go. First question. We're going to do two questions. Have a little talk. Here we go. How is your week or day? Turn the person to your left or right. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to ask this question. Ready? Go. <laughs> week or day? Not both. <laughs> I can see the smiles in your faces. All right. Now, what's really interesting about that is how many of you, when you asked that question, just by a show of hands, used one or two words to describe it? Fine, good, great. Show of hands, how many used one of those phrases? This is the norm of how we answer that question. But is it your fault how you answered it, or is it my fault how I asked it? We're going to try one more. Tell me about a project activity that you failed at. Okay? Turn the person to your left or right. Ask them that question.
All right. So here's what's fascinating about that. What we just took part in what's called, is called the deficit approach to questions. So the first question is transactional in nature. We don't really care. It's something we'll say to somebody we pass on the road. How are you? How are you? Great, great, fine, fine. Right? You don't really care if they're fine. You're just asking because it's the polite thing to say. The second question is now the individual is searching for something negative, something deficit, something that takes away value. You see, in our life, for many of us, we have these conversations in our mind, and we have these conversations with people that we know, because we're trying to search what's wrong with something. We live in a society where we think everything, everything needs to be fixed because it's always broken. When you work in an organization, they bring in consultants. They say, what's wrong? Here's what's wrong. And I'm going to charge you $100,000 to fix what's wrong. But the reality is, is that if we keep asking what's wrong with stuff, or we keep having questions that don't matter, how are we actually really engaging as human beings? So that led me to the other idea of how might the landscape of the world change if we ask different questions? So we're going to do the same thing that we just did, but we're going to have two different questions, same concept. And here's what I really need you guys to do this time. I need you to be in touch with not only the way you ask the question, but I need you to be in touch with how the other person is responding to that question. You see, often in the world that we live in, we listen to talk. The person's saying something, but you're like, ooh, what am I going to say? 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 Right? We're not listening with intent. We're not focused on creating what's called micro moments of meaning. And so now we're going to try to create a micro moment of meaning by listening with intent, by clearing our mind. Are we ready? Yes. Thank you very much, Muhammad. Are we ready? Yes. All right, here we go. What was the best part of your day and or week? Go. Can you hear how the crowd is different? Can you hear how much louder it is? Can you hear how you're searching for a moment of excellence? Awesome. Awesome. You see, what we're doing right now is we are searching for these moments that allow us to connect to a positive energy. We are searching for these moments that allow us to engage and interact with individuals in a way that does leave a fingerprint. We're going to ask one more question. And this one is a great question, because what I love about this question is when you ask it, the person usually <laughs> lights up. So you better light up on this question. <laughs> Tell me about a project or activity that you're really excited about. Here we go. Ready? Go. <laughs> After you ask the question, is there a follow-up question? Maybe why? Awesome. That's very American, right? When I say the word awesome, I can't be any more American than I say that. <laughs> so, the journey that we're on right now is that for those of you that really engage with this with intent, when you clear your minds, we're doing what's called appreciative approach. There's a famous researcher called David Kupenreiter. He came up with a concept called appreciative inquiry. And in a nutshell, what we just did was a mini appreciative inquiry. 
And the concept behind it is very simple. And the research behind it is very, very strong. That when we, as human beings, search for solutions in the past, and when we focus and ask questions from the past that are positive in nature, appreciative in nature, explorative by nature, when we bring those examples from the past and move them to the present and connect them to purpose for the future, innovation speeds up. Collaboration speeds up. Engagement is stronger. Relationships are better. But this only really works if we have a learning mindset or a growth mindset. Now, the idea of growth mindset is, comes from Carol Dweck, Dweck from Stanford University. And the concept is very simple. You're either fixed or you're growth. Fixed, you're not really open to new things. You like to take all the credit and displace all the blame. If you're growth, you love to learn. You love to fail. You love to explore when the opportunities are there, when the failure occurs. Because it's not really failure. It's an opportunity. Often when we fall on our faces, we think it's a failure. The reality is that's the opportunity. That's the gift that you're given. That's the gift in the crucible. So as you go forward today, as we listen to these different talks, at the end of each conversation, ask yourself a question. What was it about this talk that gives me strength and life? What was it about this talk that I can use to move forward? Because when we sit in this auditorium today and we listen to these seven other speakers, there's always an opportunity for growth, an opportunity to ask yourself a better question, an opportunity to connect to purpose. And on that note, Thank you. Be bold, be brave, and always, always, always be you. Thank you. <laughs>